Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining us for the spoiler talk for Inspection by Josh Mallerman. Uh, there's going to be lots to talk about over here, I already know that. At least I've got a lot to say. I got caught completely off guard halfway through this book when I turned the page and started reading about the girls. Um, and that's uh, because, like I said, I either didn't read the synopsis or I read it a year ago or, or whatnot. But for, for some reason, I was expecting them to find out about girls because Luxley is writing about them. Yeah. But I didn't expect to see the the girls' school, the the uh, the letter girls. Um. Yeah, that wasn't a thing for me because I read the synopsis, so I knew that at least they were going to be characters in the book. Um. It was, I guess, a surprise for me was that like solidly half of the book um, doesn't only refers to girls when it's, you know, the, the adults only like the, they're not actually introduced as characters until halfway through the book, which is a great move on Josh's part, by the way, because it really sets you up in that world. If we would have been doing the back and forth, I don't think we would have realized how isolated the boys and girls were. Yes. If you're constantly reading the other side. I mean, like, there's no even mention of, like, Marilyn through right. through the beginning of the book. So, it, yep. it, yeah, it was very interesting to, to the, the structure really sets you up to really understand what the boys' lives are like by steeping you in the non, there, there are no women. And to go even deeper, I don't know if you noticed this little detail, but um, it wasn't until the second half of the book that you realized that the psychiatrist's name is Barbara Burt. Because it was mm-hmm. a, it was yep. a Burt report at the beginning, so you're thinking, oh, it's a dude as well. So like, yeah, that was misdirection. Yeah, yep, for very, sure. Very well done. Um, mm-hmm. What I, structurally, what I love about this story is half of the book, like you could, you he could have done a book just with the boys, and it would have worked. So, and that's how the first half of the book feels, and then the the third part of the book. So first half is like part one and part two in the third part of the book where it's, it's heavily girl focused. Um, he's already established their world because their worlds are identical. So now it's all action. And I thought that was great. Like he, he basically told the story about the boys. So he didn't have to tell it when he got to the girls. And I think that that was very mm-hmm. well done. Very well done. Yep. That's when you realize it's a mirror image too, right? Like they have their own, their own Nancy Drew writer yeah. that writes the silly little story, <laughs> you know, whatever the, the kind of bubble gum pop books for them and stuff that they all read. Yep. Um, yeah. The one thing I didn't, so kind of early on in the book, I thought this is going to end Lord of the Flies style, right? Like where the kids mm-hmm. fucking take over. Like how else, right? Like this has got to end with there being an end to this. And really the only way to end this is going to be mutiny. Especially, like, the longer you go and find out there isn't an outside influence. Like, there's a thing where, like, a couple of the parents have shown up. Like, what happened to A? Right. And then um, we find out later that the person that Jay saw behind the tree was his dad. Right. Which was a little weird. But um, I kind of pictured it ending with a mutiny. What I didn't expect is the goddamn bloodbath. That occurred. You want to talk about this thing turning on a dime? Holy shit. I have the, I have, because I wanted to talk about, so the chapter called Revolt starts on page 364, no, 365, and it ends on 372, seven pages, Mm -hmm. in which every adult, except for one, is brutally fucking murdered. Yep. It is yeah. insanity. <laughs> and uh, I I mean it, it's it, yeah, it's visceral and it's crazy because you can't help but picture they're all 12-year-old kids. Yep. So we've we've read a number of really bloody and, and graphic books, right? But it's never been just kids going around murdering something and primarily it's the girls because the girls started and they pretty much carry out like all the big all the big deaths in this. Um yeah, it was, it was, it, 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 again, caught me off guard, even though I knew, and like you said, it's called revolt, you get all of it, but I really thought it was going to be, we're standing together, not like we're cutting throats. So, no, I, um, I was, I'm with you on that. I had no fucking idea that it was going to go 
so bloody so fast. Like, it, it was zero to a hundred in like two seconds. It was it was just the flip of a switch. It was insane. Um, but I love the fact that <laughs> they were so good at it. <laughs> that kind of like proves the point of these prodigious kids and stuff like that in a way. And even uh, at one point, it was Richard, right? Said something about how they expected to be uh, a revolt to be a, a concern when they were 20 years old and they're revolting at 12 and how like, sure. mm-hmm. like yep. oh God, even that line was so good, but man, so unexpected. Yeah. So, so well done. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. I have to agree a little bit back to the conversation we were having on the podcast. Yeah. My thought is they were never going to let him go. And I know that all the staff was contracted, but really you almost have to be contracted because you have to live there. Yeah. So, like, if I said, Rob, you're going to make $100 million, but you can never leave this area. Like, what good is it to you? Yeah. So so there almost has to be, like you said, I don't know. And I would imagine the contract's more than 10 years because Luxley probably would have bolted by then, right? But it was interesting. That all the people they picked were were scumbags. I mean, not Luxley. He right. was kind of a douchebag. But everybody else was like an ex-con that they got that had no other options. But here, if you... You just got out of prison, but if you spend X amount of time with us, you're going to be like really well off when you're done, and we'll take care of all your shit. You don't have to worry about anything. Like it's it's a pretty sweet gig if you can get past the part where you're, you know, performing an unwanted psychological experiment on a bunch of kids. Yeah, um, and that was the thing that I, I didn't really let my mind linger on too much was like what was the intended outcome. Because I think he did a good job of layering on just, like, the unreasonable, unrealistic thoughts of Richard and, uh, what's her name? Marilyn. Marilyn. Um, As the book went on, like, it became more and more obvious that, like, it was an insane goal, not, like, something well thought out, like, as the book went on. And so I I don't really know if they had a a realistic endgame in mind, regardless. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to, um, some things I would have liked to have seen in the book, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Um, one, I would have liked a little better of an explanation than Marilyn's mad that all her friends got married. Yeah, it was a little weak. Yeah, that was a little weak. Like Richard had no motivation. He does mention at one time that he kind of, you know, fucked up his life because of a woman, but it's like a throwaway sentence almost like what he could have been if he didn't have a woman in his life. Um, and then I really thought that the acronyms for mom and dad were going to were gonna spell something out. You know, I thought there was right. going to be some reveal around that. I, I guess I did when it was just D-A-D. And then when they introduced Marilyn, I was like, oh, never mind. This isn't going anywhere. Right. <laughs> but I really thought D-A-D was going to turn out to be some key, like that a kid unlocked or something. And, and I would have liked to have seen, um, just because of the way it was written, they weren't just called mom and dad that uh that there would have been a little more played out there yeah and i guess like thinking about the lack of of backstory or good characterization for marilyn or richard uh even though like they could he could have done more i don't really think that it does anything bad for the book at all i think that um yeah it plays out fine Oh, I don't, don't disagree with you. Like I said, there were just things that were like, you know, niggling little thoughts that I had throughout the book that I was hoping would be resolved. So, um, it's, talking about the very end of the book, uh, a couple of things. First of all, in the in the end of the book proper, when the kids said we want to go to Milwaukee, like wasn't mm-hmm. that just like the cutest fucking thing? Yeah. Well, that was the only exposure they had. Yeah, they all had that. They had that book needs. Yep. Um, so it's interesting cause it's the only place they ever, ever heard of. Yep. So, um, you know, I can't, I can imagine that's fairly realistic if you grow up in a household and you're always hearing, uh, your parents talk about, you know, how, how great their time, that time was that they went to whatever, you know, Jamaica or something that in yep. your mind, Jamaica becomes the place. Well, if it's the only place you've ever heard of, then guess where you're trying that's, to go? Yeah. That's the place. Milwaukee um, of all fucking places. Jesus. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing, do you, what do you think about the letter that the like the letter uh, that Barbara wrote to someone at the end, yeah. like the cult leader thing? 
Yeah. So um, here's here's what I think about that. I felt like that was um, unnecessary, and it felt like those, although they work out better in those like Avengers type movies, the like after the credit oh, scene. Yeah. Um, and and I, I mean, I get it. It's supposed to lead like this could happen again, kind of thing. I just thought it was kind of unnecessary. I was happy with them just wanting to go to Milwaukee. Yeah, I kind of felt that way too. But like in my mind, I think of the "I want to go to Milwaukee" as the end of the book, and this is almost like a post-credit scene, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but yeah, and I guess it just establishes the idea that like, um, also this psychiatrist woman learned nothing from like how horribly wrong this experiment went because she's willing to just basically help someone else do it better, which is kind mm-hmm. of kind of fucked up. So she's like. A lot, the whole time, she's the one that's like always perceived as being mostly objective and, and trying to steer them toward a good place. And then to have her kind of twist at the end was just a little bit, uh, you know, I, I gave it an all grown ups are bad kind of feel. But the Warren guy ended up being a good guy um, against all odds. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know how I felt about it. I, it, it was it was OK. Yeah, I thought of Bird as the voice of reason. Like, right. When whatever you think, when you know it's a guy or you know it's a woman or whatever, was like, all right, I got to steer you guys back on track on the best way to do this, you know? So it's like a, like a referee of sorts, you know, yeah. kind of trying to steer them in the right direction. Um, yeah, overall, man, I mean, it, this, this was, uh, it, it was the shortest 380 page book I've ever read, Seriously. which I'll probably repeat on the, on the, on the other side of the podcast. But, man. <laughs> You want to talk about a book that did not like slow down to a point where I was bored. When I had to stop reading it, it's because I had to do stuff, not because I go, I've read it enough and put it down and do something else. So something that we didn't touch on uh, uh, yet that I think is important to talk about is the first romantic interaction between a boy and a girl. I felt like as I was reading it, I was thinking, so he's playing on the idea that we are just instinctive instinctively kind of drawn. Like there's something that we see in this other, it it goes back to normal instinct. Right. Um, and we just kind of do what feels natural regardless of like a societal cultural understanding of what that is. Um, but it was just really fucking cute. Yeah, it was, uh, it was very blue lagoon. Are you familiar with blue lagoon? No. Blue Lagoon was a movie back in the 80s that was a little controversial. And I, I saw it like 30 years ago, so I'm sure I'm going to get some of this wrong. But, but there's a shipwreck. Yeah. And um, there's a, I don't remember, I think there's an adult woman and then the two children, but the adult woman dies. So you follow these kids who are probably like 10 fending for themselves. But of mm. course, as they get a little bit older, they uh, they start to discover things about one another. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was, yeah, it reminded me, I was, I thought, man, they went zero to 60 pretty quick. So there's the, the scene, right. Where she's like, uh, she's like, uh, Hey, look, and she like takes off her pants, yep. <laughs> points at her junk, she's like, take off your pants. And I thought like, all right, that's a little forward. But I thought to myself, if you grew up only around men or only around women, there probably wouldn't be the same kind of whatever shame factor involved. Right. Yeah. In, in in being exposed to someone else. So when you met someone that was a lot like you, like you don't have that that idea that I'm not supposed to do this. So that scene was uh <laughs> that scene was interesting. But yeah, they went from that to like like sleeping together, like at least sleeping, sleeping, like boom. Like they knew that's what was supposed to happen. Yeah, it was nice. Um the only thing I brought up, and this is just my like it brought up in my mind, and this is just my mind being like a pain in the ass, but like there had to be some gayness going on. Right. Um, I don't know. Maybe, um, well, they're I mean, at that age by the time, yeah, well, I, if it wasn't, it was probably going to start happening. Like 12 is a good, is a good age where you don't probably don't have to address that. Right. Much like the publisher weekly review that I read, which I got to read this and I don't want to read this on the podcast and you might even cut it out of here. I don't know. There are parts of this book that require near impossible suspension of disbelief. No thought is given what of what would happen if one of the kids turns out to be queer or transgender, for example. All right. And and this is why I brought it up at that age. And, and I've talked to, I mean, we, you know, I've talked to pl- plenty of 
uh, gay people in my life who have, you know, discovered their attraction to the same sex, like at different ages in life, or at least became aware of it. So like, but, but as a seven year old before, you know, puberty and everything, you could just equate that to being like, I really like hanging out with my best friend. Like it doesn't have necessarily a sexuality to it yet, mm-hmm. even though it will evolve into sexuality. So I feel like probably Mallerman did the best at, at picking the age he did because of all of the things that don't have to be answered yet. Sure. And to be fair though, how much of that, how much of our, whatever sexualization, if that's what we want to call what we're talking about, I don't even know if that's the right word, but is, you know, maybe you see your mom and dad kiss. Maybe, you know, that people are supposed to hold hands. If you were raised completely without that, yeah. how likely is it that it would take much longer to get to, you know, the fact that you can, you know, uh, pleasure yourself or that someone else can, you know what I mean? Like how much longer would it be if you've mm-hmm. never seen two people kiss or hold hands or hug or know yeah. that there's a relationship that's something other than that's my buddy. He laughs at my jokes. That's you a know? good point. Like absence, yeah. the concept of romance, mm-hmm. what do you do with your feelings that you're feeling? Either you incorporate them into the world that you know mm-hmm. by being like, Oh, that's my friend. That's why I'm so happy when I see him. Or you just don't get it. Like, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. By the way, I didn't like this. Uh, I'm going to read you the rest of this review. Fans of bad horror movies might find the story fun, but if Mallerman intends it to be a serious exploration of gender or parenting, it falls far short. Oh, man. That probably that person probably isn't a parent and probably doesn't have a gender. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> Both of those are possible. At any rate. <laughs> It was one of the reviews I I pulled up, um, and I didn't think was uh, I didn't think was was uh, it's not favorable, and I don't know that I agree with it. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not leaning toward agreeing with it, but um, it was an interesting thing to see how gender and romance was covered in in that world that you know created created a bubble without those things, um, and it made me think of the gay thing. But like like we talked about, I feel like he by not talking about it did the best was that was the best approach for it for sure and then you know the the other thing too is and you mentioned reading an article that talked about feminism and stuff i'm you know i'm never sure how far an author is going to examine a subject you know what i mean or did he have an idea that'd be weird if boys grew up not knowing they were girls and vice versa and how do i put that into a story without making it about female empowerment or uh, gender studies or, you know what I mean? Like how much of this is just, I thought this would be a great story and it didn't need all of the extra. Obviously you have to put in some of the parenting things, right? There's a man raising 26 kids. Like he makes all the decisions for their lives and stuff, but but I don't know how deep, you know, Mallerman meant to go. And I'm sure that especially if this book rises up the charts, which I fully expect it will, that there'll be a lot, a lot of, um, discussion about the things he did wrong in this book. Yeah. And that's just, it's dumb. The more I think about it, the more I think that having a world where there is one gender kind of takes the gender conversation out of things because it's not like one being better than the other. It's just one growing up on its own. I, I don't know. Like, yep. so people will read in what they want to about things. I think. But for end, sure like i think mallerman did a great job like approaching all of the things that are usually difficult to talk about gender uh sexuality parenting all that stuff Mm-hmm. for sure anything else you want to do before we head back over to book proper that's gonna do it for me all right Thank you, patrons, um, for being patrons. And thanks for listening to this extra little bit that we do. Rob and I would probably have these conversations um, uh, anyway. They'd probably be a little um, less formal, a little more talking over one another, probably some name calling. But we we clean it all up for you guys. Uh, So we appreciate you um, in every way, shape, and form. And uh, come back next week where I feel very strongly there will be spoiler talk about the next book we're reading, too.